it's been a while um, that I stand up to lead and have people in front of me. <laughs> this is so nice. Wow. Welcome. God bless you for making the time on a Sunday morning to come to worship. Um, as you know, we are here next week. Apparently, God decided that right over the Cummings Yard, there shall be no rain. <laughs> and so we'll enjoy the no rain right here. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we're going to ask the Cummings to lead us in worship this morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are present. I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to beseech you. You are just here. And so I pray, Lord, that as we stop, as we take this time to intentionally stop our busyness of the week, that we would look up and look around and see the fingerprints of God on the people beside us, in front of us, behind us, the sky, the clouds, the beautiful trees. Lord, you are here, and all of creation screams that you alone are God. May our hearts focus on you as we sing, as we listen, and as we soften in the presence of your spirit. Welcome your people. Allow us to know that you alone are God. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. We welcome the comings that they welcome us to their home. We welcome them to lead us in worship, and I pray that this will be an encouraging time for you. Can anyone? Oh, there we are. That was a little stunning. I am hiding in here. Um, we call this a piano pope place or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, that's where I am, in case you're wondering, you can't see. And uh, uh, if you'd like to, we chose this spot here because it's sort of shaded, but it also doesn't have trees that will drip on you. So that's the reason for the move. Um, so if you'd like to stand and join us, join with us in, uh, in our songs, I think you probably have song sheets. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you.
to see you.
Lord God, as we come before you this morning, and we just sang about uh, the need for a new heart, that we want to be able to see you in a new way, so we need to open the eyes of our heart, and how we need a humble heart to see you. And we know for that to happen, Lord, it would be just pure grace. It would be your grace poured out to us. And, and that, it, that is just so typical of you, our good Father, who pours out his grace on his people. You save us. You bring us together. You give us hope for today and for a future. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing amongst your people. Be with us this day, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I know we're more of a community church, but this is so Baptist. You know, last time I up, was up, there were half the people. <laughs> they all just kept coming. You need to sit a little closer. Okay, um, I wanted to just share with you one thought before we do our announcements. And uh, I'm in the middle of reading a book, and it is on prayer. But it is um, about praying through the watches of the night. And as many of you, especially women in our 50s plus, we wake up in the middle of the night for no unknown reason. <laughs> it's just there. So I started thinking I want to be productive with that time. Anyhow, in this book it says, We cannot enter the mystery of Christ alive in me, which is from Galatians 2.20. We cannot enter the mystery of Christ alive in me without first doing a stripping of self. When we ask God to fill us, we must first be willing to be emptied out to make room. Had it not rained, I was going to bring this little suitcase, and I had stuffed it full of clothing. And um, it was dark, and I brought light clothing. And I, I just wanted to make the point, you know, until I take some, there was nothing else going into that little suitcase until I started taking some other things out. And that is a picture of our very life. We are stuffed full of things. And I started thinking um, this idea of stripping of self is coming before God, and I thought there's a few real basic ones. M many of you know that, you know, the core primal sin we all struggle with to even come to Christ is pride. And so in stripping off pride, which is, you know, look at me, listen to me. You know, I understand the right way. My perspective is right. Why doesn't anybody ever listen to me? That pride is a killer. And so that needs to come out before the humility of God can enter in. Anger and unforgiveness. You and I are not heading to heaven without first bending our knee to Jesus Christ. And when we do, there's that moment where we realize how much we have been forgiven. And that's the attitude you need to bring to others in order to forgive others, to empty out the anger and bitterness that keeps you from forgiving. Another one, a strong one, is lust, which is also me first. <clears throat> my needs, my desires must be met for power, money, intimacy. Me first. I need to take care and self-gratify the longing of my... That's actually not true. You don't need to put you first at all. And the last one I want to mention in terms of the emptying out is disunity. If you don't promote unity within our body, within your family, within your relationships, if you don't promote unity, you're part of the problem. And unity forgives. <laughs> unity puts pride aside. Unity doesn't say, I must come first, and my ways and needs must come first. And those things need to be emptied out of our little suitcase before we can know what it is to be filled with the Spirit of God. If you read the um, midweek focus, Billy Graham once said this beautiful thing, which was, let the Spirit of God convict people. <laughs> let him convict those who you struggle with. He's the one who judges and our job is to love.
The Spirit convicts. God judges. We're called to love. I pray as a community, especially as we're starting to gather again, and hopefully we'll be heading to church shortly, that would be heart's desire to sow humility and unity within our body. Otherwise, we will eat ourselves up from the inside out. It is a blessing to have the community of Revive. Let me pray for us as you consider what needs to drain and what needs to be filled. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you are our example, that we can look to you who was criticized and misunderstood, and yet you chose love. You chose love. And I pray, Lord, that it would be within our hearts as a community of believers to choose love. Patience and kindness and quick to forgive. Come, Lord, and open our hearts to what you want to say to us. You are here and your spirit is at work. Speak to us today, I pray, in the strong name of Christ. Amen. So we are here one more time next week, unless it rains. If it rains, we'll be heading to um, the church on the hill. And starting August 1st, so right at the beginning, middle of the summer, we're heading to back to the church at 1115. Many of you said, it's so nice to be outside. I agree, but we are heading back there. We are allowed 50%, which is 100 people, and I think we're under 75 right now, so hopefully we have room for more. Uh, also, Youth Unlimited has summer camps. <clears throat> Please check your emails this week. The junior camp is for five to seven-year-olds in Maxwell. It's, it's half days, 8.30 till noon, fun fitness and movement. Um, Rebecca Wave, Sheldon Wave. While you're yawning, there you go. So they are very involved. And if you have an interest and haven't signed up online, just talk to Rebecca. Sheldon's the director this year, and Rebecca's his boss. Uh, secondly, Youth Unlimited has a teen night on Thursday night this week. And I've heard it's from 7 to 9.30, and there's pizza involved. So, yeah, if you want to pretend that you're 17, <laughs> just ask. Also, Viv's Book Club. Viv is out west. Many of you are following her on Facebook and seeing pictures. Uh, Hind's Feet on High Places, the book club meeting, is at our house this week. I'm going to be facilitating that. And it is chapter 9 to 12 from 7 o'clock onward. So if you're coming, we'll be meeting outside. Uh, also, if there are any other announcements, can you just quickly let me know? Okay, so we are going to take a time of prayer, and I'm going to start just by giving you a few of the prayers that uh, we were we have been told this week. Shelley's mom moved into the Maxwell Manor this week. Good? Very good. And so Kathy from our church has been very helpful, Kathy Belair, and she's in Shelley's mom's wing. Also, we continue to pray. I truly hope that when you read these, you will pray for Ron Hutt, for Marie Hobe, for John, who was going to come this morning, but boy, the weather plays with um, those who have joint issues. Um, uh, Neil McCrimmon is still ongoing in cancer treatments. Lizette wanted to come. She's been so faithful to come and is just not feeling very well. Please pray for Lizette. Sarah, we're glad that you're here. We know that you have ongoing issues. We continue to pray for you as a church. Uh, Gilles Martin. And um, Gabrielle Campbell, who is recovering from her surgery, we're very thankful uh, that it went so well. We're praying for Cheryl's brother, who um, was a, in a very serious accident in October 2020. October 2020. He shattered his femur. There was surgery. It didn't heal properly. And he was told he'd have to have another surgery. And unexpectedly, that opened up this week. Right, Cheryl? went really, really well. So for those of you who didn't hear, he might be coming home as early as um, Monday or Tuesday this week. What an answer to prayer. The other thing is that there are couples getting married, Kaylee and Alex on August 15th, Jordan and Marie. So nice to have you, Marie. So everybody who hasn't met Marie, you can just 
like overwhelm her right after the service. Um, they'll be getting married August 21st. Please pray for these young couples. And we're going to pray for couples in general. Uh, marriage, as many of you know who are married, is a whole lot of work. And it can be wonderful and painful. <laughs> and so we are going to pray for them as they're heading into this lovely experience. <laughs> and pray for the rest of us who have made that decision and, um, and continue to need prayer. Okay, am I lying? Marriage is hard. Okay. Right, Bruce? Marriage is hard. <laughs> Painful. All right. Let me pray for us. I'm just going to give you one moment uh, to think about one of the things I've said. Just lift up your heart to God, open to let him see and hear the things that you are saying to him right now. And then I'll pray for us corporately. Lord, when we give thanks, it is because we recognize the work that you have done in our lives. And uh, so many times we live unaware. You spark our awareness of all that you have done for us. And it just inspires us to, to thank you. And so I do thank you, Lord, for um, both the example of Christ and his bride the commitment and love that he has for us, regardless of where we find ourselves today. I give you thanks, Lord, that you accept us and love us and stand by us and don't quit. Lord, we pray that blessing of unity and love over Kaylee and Alex and Marie and Jordan as they enter this season of joining their lives a reflection of you and your church. Bless them, Lord. And Lord, may we as a community continue to look to the bride of Christ, us and Jesus who is our head, and choose obedience to show forgiveness and kindness and warmth and unity to not put ourselves at the center, but to look to you, the Almighty. And know that we have been saved from an eternity without you. And our need of you is so great. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are in need. And know that you can meet with each of them personally. Shelley's mom, Shelley's sisters, Shelley herself and her family as they care for her. For Ron, Marie, John, Neil, Lisette, Sarah, Jill, Gabrielle. For Kyle. God. Our hope and their hope is in the work you will do in their lives. And so we pray that you would see them and hear them and know. I pray they would know they are remembered and they are prayed for and cared for. Come, Lord, in your power as we meet. Come in your power to teach us, convict us, and draw our hearts ever closer to you. May our knees bend to you alone. And may we hear with open ears what the Spirit of God has to say to us this morning. I pray this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Birgit. My painful marriage partner. <laughs> That's what she said to me as I got up here. <laughs> Uh, so here's um is that really loud or is that just me it's okay okay good all right hey if you say it's good it's good if i see you starting to do this i'll, I'll take that as a cue ah yeah so where's this line from this is a question for you it's not about you. I knew you'd know this, Mark. 
Anybody else? Or Birgit, anybody else? No? Okay, where's it from? Yep. I think it's sentence one, too. Yeah, yeah. First four words, it's not about you. All right, somebody quiet the crowd down, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I want to speak about something that um, I see it, it's, it, I see it as a huge need in our society, in our church, uh, as Christians and individuals, and within relationships. It's the issue of humility, the issue of humility. And if you really want to get a grasp on humility, start just as Rick's book starts. It's not about you. Nothing can kind of ground you into that place of humility or put your feet in the right place as that understanding. Wow. Because it is in our sin nature that that will be the huge battle that we face in life. Because our sin nature constantly calls us back to, it's about me. And Jesus and the Spirit constantly call us to, it's not about me. General humility, if you looked it up in a dictionary, you'd see it's the state of being humble. Uh, it means to be free of pride, free of arrogance. It is to have a low view of oneself. Well, see, the world kind of takes that and they, and they, and they twist that in, a, in the wrong way. They, they say that, and that's why humility tends to get a bad rap in the world. It's seen more as things like a lack of confidence. Oh, wow, they're really humble. They just have a lack of confidence. That you don't actually love yourself. That you have no pride of self. And so humility gets a bad rap. But biblical humility, and this isn't out of any Bible dictionary or anything, I, I've summed it up this way. It's an accurate view of self. It's an accurate view of self. And Ultimately, at the core of it, it's not something I can put into a definition, but it's just to truly reflect Jesus' character. Because Jesus was perfectly humble. He didn't lack self-confidence. He didn't lack identity. He knew who he was. He could be strong when he needed to be strong. Right, Rudy? Yeah. yeah. But... And, 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 and anyways, that's where I want to kind of delve into is kind of, you really want to understand biblical humility, look at Jesus, okay? Um, a friend uh, reminded me of this passage this week, Matthew 11, verses 28, 29. It goes like this. You probably recognize it. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. A lot of translations translate that humble. It means the same thing. To be humble or to be lowly in heart. And the promise is you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, to do justice to this, I need to tell you that uh, this primarily is, at, is focused at salvation. That come the invitation, it's a beautiful invitation that anybody can come to Jesus. You don't have to earn your way. You don't have to do all these things. That's the heavy yoke. And Jesus is saying, my yoke is light. My yoke is easy. Put your faith in me. Come, trust me. Right? But it also really speaks to this issue of humility. And it really speaks to what it is to, to if, if we're going to grasp humility and we look to Jesus, 
we can learn from this passage. Because the promise is that, that of rest. The promise is rest. And what's another word for rest? Think of tension. Peace. Thank you. Peace. How many of us don't want peace? So many of us are striving after peace. The language is that of, in Jesus' day, the, I call, call it the day laborer, you know? Think of it. It's, it, it all you who, are, who, are, who labor, all who labor and all who are heavy laden. And I always, Jesus always paints beautiful pictures, and it's very vivid. I picture someone, a worker, with a great big load or a great big wheelbarrow, and they're staggering to go up the hill. Have you ever picked up something so heavy, you put it on your shoulder and you literally stagger, and the person goes, whoa, are you okay? You know, like that's the idea here, that there's so much of a load on you that you're staggering. And, 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 and the idea is that there's, uh, the English word that I would grab is weariness. We are so weary. And, and yet it's not the answer, even though the picture is that of a day laborer carrying the heavy load and, and, and you're heavy and you're staggering, it's meant just as figurative language to speak about the spiritual side of your life. Because the, the rest that you get is not rest from weary muscles or aching bones or sore joints. The promise is you will find rest for your souls. So this, the, he's talking about our spiritual life. And so when we think of the weariness of the laborer then, well, what weighs down our soul? Well, so often it's relational weariness. Relational weariness. And, and you, can, you can picture that. And maybe you're in a season of that now, or maybe that was a season recently. And, and, you know, you and your spouse are just not on great terms. Things have shifted. You can blame COVID. Uh, You know, hey, you're not normally home. (laughs) And now you're under my feet. (laughs) You know, uh, that is actually happening. And, And... People are looking to that. Sometimes it's something like an empty nest syndrome or a midlife crisis. Something's shifted. Whatever the cause, and there seems to be a lot of it these days, a lot of it, it can cause relational weariness. Ah, we argue too much. We're just not on the same page. We don't see things the same way. We're really getting on each other's nerves. The spark's gone out. Weariness can be caused by busyness. You're just living a crazy, hectic schedule. It can be caused by you're you're giving yourself too much. You're taking on the emotional loads of others. Uh, Weariness is something that caregivers often recognize. You're caring for someone who's ill that can end up being incredibly weary. Weariness can be caused by pain and health, and and it can wear you down. It can also be caused by sin. That is to knowingly do what you know God does not want you to do. And that's a load that we put on ourselves, and the price we pay for that We just can't fully grasp. It will truly wear you out. Weariness. I think of that ancient prophet, Bilbo Baggins. And he says, he said he felt like he tired, like butter scraped over too much bread. No, and maybe you're feeling like that. Maybe you're feeling thin, 
like butter scraped over too much bread. I think most of us can relate to a time of weariness. Like I said, it, it, you may be in it, or it may have been a season ago, or forgive me, but maybe it's coming. Well, let's learn from the Scriptures. Let's, let's learn from God. How do, we, how do we survive this? How do we overcome this weariness? And as I said, I want to talk to you about humility. So that's where I'm going. The path of humility is the way through weariness, the way to overcome weariness. If you want to truly understand that text in Matthew 11, you have to grasp those words. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. Watch me. Learn. And then he goes on, and do you know what he says next? For I am gentle and humble of heart, or lowly of heart. I am gentle and lowly. So we got to learn. Now, now, we know that God's desire for you and I, for followers of Jesus, is to take on the image of his son. That's Romans 8, 29. We're predestined to conform to the image of his son. He wants us to take on his image. Now, that doesn't mean my facials are going to change and I'm going to start to look like Jesus looked. No, it's what we sang about, that we need a new heart. That Jesus, he wants us, God wants us to take on the character of Jesus. And so here we got Jesus in this passage saying, learn from me. Oh, I'm to take on the character of Jesus. And here's Jesus saying, learn from me. All right, that's looking like an equation that adds up pretty easily. And then he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. So I would say this, a lot of weariness comes when we are out of step with the character of Jesus. A lot of weariness comes when we're out of step with Jesus' character. He says, take on... What was that image he said, he asked for us to put on our backs? The yoke. He says, take on my yoke. Do you know what a yoke was used for? Yes, two oxen, to hook oxen together. I remember reading years ago, I couldn't actually find the exact stats, but it was like one oxen can pull something like 2,000 pounds. It's, it's weight. It's body weight. And two oxen hitched together, working together, can pull something like 16 times. It's incredible. Don't quote me on that. Look it up. See, maybe someone will find the exact number, and you'll get back to me and go, well, actually, it was six times. Okay. That's great. Um, it is, it's way more. It's not just, well, one can pull two, two can pull four. No, two can pull way more. And, um, and yet they can't do that unless they're perfectly yoked and they pull together. And so that Jesus says, come take on my yoke. In other words, we would say, you know, in English, what we would talk about, we'd say, well, walk in step. Walk in step. You know, Bergen and I, we used to love go skating on the canal. And we would pretend that we were like these really famous figure skaters, you know, would have arms and we would try to do that crossover, you know. That we're, but, boy, you got to do both together or suddenly one of us is hitting the ice, you know. So you got to do it in step, you know, the big steps over. And, and that's the idea here. you gotta, you got to walk in step. So weariness in our soul can be the, the result of being out of step. In other words, and Jesus' character, what he's saying here is he's saying, I'm gentle. I'm gentle and I'm humble. So you want to walk in step with me? you got to learn to be gentle and you got to learn to be humble. That's what he's saying. And I want to come back to that relational weariness that I... I I'm just, I'm being confronted with a lot of it these days. And uh, 
you know, many of us, when we're in that relational weariness, we would say, well, I feel worn out because the other isn't, they're not open to correction, they're unwilling to bend, they're unwilling to change, they're unwilling to cooperate, they're unwilling to talk, they're unwilling to care, they're unwilling to be affectionate. Pick your poison. We end up blaming the other. That's why I feel weary because my spouse or my friend or my, my, my partner at work, they're unwilling. And yet Jesus' call is for you to walk in humility with gentleness. So let's look at Jesus' humility. And there's only two trademarks I want to look at. The first is his willingness, and there's a key word, willingness to bring himself low. And then the other one is his willingness to sacrifice. And, and there are two sides of the same coin. You might notice when I say Jesus' willingness to bring himself low, this word low seems to constantly pop up when it comes to humility. Low pops up. Um, Philippians 2 is the key passage there. If you know it at all, it, it, Philippians is part of the prison epistles. Paul's writing from, from prison, probably in Rome. And he doesn't know if he's going to get out of here alive. Okay? So that's his context. And He's writing to the Philippians, and he gets to chapter 2, and, and his big thing is he's trying to encourage them to serve each other, to serve each other, to put the needs of others before themselves. In order to do that, you've got to bring yourself low. You've got to put the needs of the others in, ahead of you. And as an example, he, he holds up several examples. He holds himself up as an example. He says, do as I do. And when you look at the context, you go, hey, this guy's right. This guy, his life is on the line. He's in prison, and he's still taking the time to care for others. He's trying to build up the church at Philippi. Yeah, he's a good example of bringing himself low. He uses Timothy. He uses Epaphroditus. He, he, he cites their work in the Lord and their willingness to serve. And then... His Magna Carta, his primary example, is obviously Jesus. And I'll read to you from passage from chapter two. I'm going to read four verses from five to eight. Listen to how Paul speaks about how Jesus was willing to bring himself low, and by doing that, it's it's what Berg was talking about about emptying ourselves. Here it is. So remember, he wants them to serve each other. So he says, have this mind among yourselves. In other words, take on this attitude. Yoke yourself to this attitude, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's available to you. It's part of what Jesus gives you. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He is God. He's equal to God. He's God the Son, second member of the Trinity. And yet, he didn't hang on to that. He didn't come to earth and go, hey, I'm God. Bow. Humble yourself. Treat me like God. He emptied himself of that. So that's what it says. He goes on. Did not consider a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, bringing himself low, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What do we see but Jesus giving up the glories of Godhood 
taking on the form of a man to bring us salvation. It's a clear, obvious example of his willingness to humble himself, to bring himself low. He gives up all his honor, all the glory that's due him, to him, all the respect that was due to him. As I was writing this, all of a sudden I had this sickening feeling, and it was like, can you imagine being Pontius Pilate? Can you imagine being Herod? Can you imagine being one of those soldiers who spit on Jesus, who smacked him around, and then after they die, seeing Jesus as God in his glory? Like, that would just fill them with horror to realize how they treated him in this lifetime. And, and from time to time, you get glimpses of really important people kind of bringing themselves down. I remember on July 4th, I caught on the news, there's President Biden. He's got the apron on, and he's flipping burgers at some place, which is great. Don't get me wrong. That's great. Unfortunately, often those things are staged for photo ops. And that's not he, true humility. God doesn't want you just a moment of your time. He doesn't want a photo op. He wants you to yoke your character to Jesus, to walk in step with him. And Jesus was willing to give up all his rights, to give up his reputation that was due to him because of his title. He was willing to bring himself low. Secondly, Jesus' humility is characterized by his willingness to sacrifice. You couple that willingness to bring yourself low with a willingness to sacrifice, and suddenly you have this, I'm not, I'm not only am I not demanding my rights, I'm actually acting on your behalf. That's what Jesus does. He comes and he, and he willingly acts on our behalf, even though he was due the worship from us, yet he came and served us by giving of his life for us. Can you picture a relationship where each spouse, each friend, each coworker willingly gives of themselves? Willingly brings themselves low and sacrifices for the other. Not demanding rights, not demanding honor, not demanding that they get their own way or that things should work this way. It's hard to imagine a relationship as beautiful as that. Where there's mutual respect, the desire to serve each other, the desire to honor the other and genuinely care and sacrifice for the other. You imagine two friends, two people at work who have completely diverse ideas, totally different opinions about a subject, and yet they treat each other with complete humility. Hard to see that going wrong. Can you imagine two Christians who have Completely different views about vaccinations. But having complete humility about the other's perspective. Hard to see that going wrong. What we need to grasp is that the answer that Jesus gives to us is yoke yourself to me, walk in step with me, be like I was. And he says, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. Now, before I end, there's just, I want to tell you there's some bad news about this and there's some good news. What do you want first? But, um, okay, all right, I'll give you the bad news. Give you the bad news. Everybody wants bad news. I, 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 you were getting the bad news first no matter what you said. <laughs> I just play with you. Uh, here's the bad news. You're never going to get that right. You're never going to get that right. Our feet are grounded here in this world. Our feet are clay. Our feet are tied to our body. 
and we still have the vestiges of the sinful nature, even though we're new creations in Christ, we still fight the old man, the old woman. The other side of the bad news, yeah, there's more than one set of bad news. If you're thinking in terms of relational difficulty, relational weariness, where you desperately need peace, you can't make make the other person humble themselves. You can't make the other person humble themselves. If you haven't figured that out yet in life, you are hitting yourself, your head against a wall. You can only be willing to give up your rights. You can't make anyone else give up theirs. It may be the man who has to humble himself. It may be the wife who has to humble himself. It may be the older friend who has to humble themselves. It may be the person who's in the right who has to humble themselves. That's the bad news. Now, the the good news is we don't have to wait till heaven. We don't have to wait till glorification to get better at humility. And the best part of the good news is that God says, I will help you. I will help you at this. I'm willing to give you my power, my assistance, and, don't miss this, my favor. God promises us his favor if we will set our hearts on seeking humility. Here's how he expresses that. It's written a few times in Scripture, for one, one, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Easy one to remember. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. God opposes the proud. You know how this ends. But gives grace to the humble. Gives grace to the humble. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited means you don't deserve it. So God's saying, if you set your heart on being humble, if you, set, if you don't and you just remain proud, he says, I'll oppose you. But he says, if you're willing to bring yourself low, if you're willing to sacrifice, he says, I will give you my favor, my grace, undeserved, unmerited. And what you've got to get your head around there is to realize that you're now walking into the storehouses of God's favor, and he has unlimited resources in which to bless you, unlimited ways to help you, unlimited ways to encourage you and to lift you up. He has unlimited resources. To gain the favor of God is by far the best thing in the world. God's favor comes to us when we humble ourselves, when we're willing to bring ourselves low, to ask for forgiveness, to repent of our sins, to admit our weaknesses, admit where we go wrong, and to ask for others to give us grace. Forgive us. Let us try again. I used to have this book of, uh, of analogies back in the day when you had to uh, get the magazine and look for your books and, and, and not just jump on the Internet. And I found one on a book of analogies. I was a really young pastor. I got it. Eh, most of them were like from the 1800s, you know, these analogies. But I found one that I loved. I've gone back to it over and over again. It's this. It's of a couple of mountain goats. Guys watching mountain goats, and if you've ever seen mountain goats, they, they can manage on the smallest little paths and, and ledges and stuff, and they can navigate. And he's watching mountain goats go across this one tiny path. He can't even picture how the heck are they staying on this thing. It's so tiny. And then he sees a lone billy goat come along. 
a male. And then he sees another male coming from the other side. And he's like, oh, no. Uh, they're going to fight? And at least one is going to plummet to their death. Maybe two. Maybe they'll both lose their balance in this fight. This is going to be horrible. And so he's, he, he's got his binoculars. He's watching. He's zoned in. And he can't believe what happens. One lays down and the other goes over. And I know the objections that immediately come up in our heads. I'm tired of going down. I'm tired of being the one to always lay down because I feel trampled. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. That is a picture of humility. That is a picture of humility. And you will never do it, and you'll never do it well without the grace of God and without the favor of God to help you. So focus on this. This is God's will. This is God's desire. He wants you to become like Jesus. He wants you to walk in step with Jesus. He invites you to walk with him, to humble yourself, to be willing to bend low and sacrifice yourself, as Jesus did. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of bad news there. You have no guarantee that you lay yourself down, let the other walk over you, that they just don't go, well, that's how it should be. That's how it should be. You have no guarantee that they won't take advantage of you, they won't just walk on you again and again. That's why we need God's grace if we are going to truly humble ourselves and say, Jesus, I can only do this sort of thing in your power, by the power of your spirit. The only thing you have, it's all you need, is to know that you're doing as Jesus would do. Which to me is I'm doing what God wants me to do when I'm able to do that. You are seeking to honor God, and God says he will honor you and he will give grace to you. That's it. That's all. Allow me to pray for us, please. Lord, when we look at this from a human perspective, it can make us frustrated. It can make us angry. We don't like being stepped on. We don't like sacrificing ourselves. We don't like having our rights trampled. We don't like when people disrespect us or dishonor us. Lord, we can only look to you and see how the willingness you have to bring yourself low, the willingness to sacrifice. And we hear the words of Paul, let this mind be of you. Jesus, I pray that you would give us wisdom on how to understand this, how to bring this into our lives, that we would truly walk in step with you. I pray this for couples. I pray this for close relationships. I pray this for peers and friends. I pray this for neighbors. I pray you would help us to have your mindset. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Wherever you go this week, whatever you do, 
Remember, you represent Jesus Christ at home, at work, abroad. You represent Jesus. So do that well. Amen.